Today we're going to be looking at an encounter that Jesus has, and it's sort of two or three stories that intertwine together uh, in which two people are healed. And so our scripture today is from Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. And neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wine will be wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. While he was saying this, the synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I can only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Just Jesus turned and saw her and said, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put out outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up, and news of this spread throughout all of that region. Last week, one of the things I said to you as we're going through this series on Messiah, that one of the things I I did in preparation, and to kind of continue to do this a little bit, is ask myself this question when kind of reading through the Gospels, is, is to say, what were the things that Jesus consistently did that demonstrated that he was the Messiah. And these are the four things that I've come to. There may be others for other people, but these are the four that work for me. He taught with authority, he healed the sick, he performed miracles, and he revealed the kingdom. So last week we talked about him teaching with authority and did that. This week I want to talk about healing. So there are two people that were healed in this story. And I want to mention this to you, that the, when people, the people that study this kind of thing tell us that there were probably 38 miracles that occurred throughout the Gospels, some recorded in some and not recorded in others, but if you add them all together, you have 38 miracles. But out of the 38 miracles, 21 of them were healings. So a big percentage, over half of Jesus' miracles, were people being healed of some illness or disease. And they varied, right? Uh, There were people with withered hands, there were people who were paralyzed who couldn't walk. Uh, This woman healed from the blood, a leper healed. You know, and on the list goes. And sometimes he would lay hands on them and they would be healed. Other times he would just speak a word and they weren't even present. And the person that came to ask for the healing would go back and it was reported that at that very hour that person was healed when Jesus just spoke that word from a distance. So there are no specific patterns, but what is true, it is in the heart of God for people to be healed. It's also true that we should say this. You need to know that, that out of the 21 people that were healed and out of these miracles that that's not a collective number. We don't mean that 21 people were healed. Lots more people were healed besides the 21 that we know of specifically. Because in some cases, you may remember this multiple times, that when healing began, it said that the people of that village brought everyone who was sick to Jesus and he healed them all. Now imagine, some of you sitting here today taking medication for diabetes or high blood pressure, or you've got a relative that's battling cancer, or whatever it might be. Imagine that we got a report that someone has the true gift of healing, and they're at the depot, and if you'll bring your loved one down there, that person would be healed. Forget doctors, forget medicines, forget another test or x-ray or MRI. Just come down and let this person lay. I mean, it would be packed, right? So we have those settings where that occurred, and, and it talks about they just brought everybody that was sick. And, and he healed them all. So healing was a big part, and it demonstrated who he was as the Messiah. What I want to do today is look at these stories that are woven together and look at the four groups of people or four individuals. It's two individuals, two groups, who kind of make up the story. First of all, you have, this, the story began with me reading about the disciples of John the Baptist. 
They come to Jesus and they have a question. They seem to be probably a little upset, maybe a little confused. Maybe they're trying to challenge him. Maybe they're just looking for information. Whatever the case was, they don't understand why when they fast as a, as a habit and the Pharisees are fasting as a habit, why is it that Jesus' disciples are not fasting? And so they question him. Why, why don't you fast? Right? What, what does it do? They, they're struggling with this key component or key ritualistic habit of the Jewish people. They can't understand. I mean, you're supposed to be this leader and, and whatever, and, and yet you're ignoring the, the discipline and habit of fasting. Can I just say to you today that the ritual is never intended to be more important than the person who started it? Amen. You get that? Rituals are not supposed to be bigger than the God who instituted them. We will celebrate what is at some level a ritual. Jesus stood up right at the Last Supper and said, Do this as my followers. Take the cup, take, take the bread. This is my body, this is my blood. But, but the ritual is not the point. The, the point of the ritual is to point to the one who instituted the ritual. It's for us to remember what he did for us and who he is as our Savior. And if we're not careful, even in our society today, even in church today, ritual can be more important than the presence of God. And that's part of what was kind of going on here. But they're going like fasting. Lord Jesus, how can you be so nonchalant about this critically important practice that goes back generations? How can you be that way? And Jesus had an answer, didn't he? By the way, it's kind of funny that they asked that. By this point in Jesus' ministry, he'd already performed eight or nine other miracles, and they knew about them, right? He stilled the storm, there was a miraculous catch of fish, he heals a paralytic and different other ones. And yet, with him doing all of that, what they're concerned about is, is he checking the box at the local synagogue of the things people are supposed to do if they're religious people? And that's what they're concerned about. So rather than, you know, seeing God's hand... And, what's being revealed in his life as he heals people and he does miracles, they are hung up on this. They, they are kind of like this. Why aren't you following the rules? I understand rule followers because I used to be one. I've kind of gotten over it a little bit. And I won't clarify that while we're on tape. But can I tell you this? We should all be careful in our lives if we ever find ourselves leaning more towards rules than we are towards relationships. It's all about who He is and our relationship to Him, not about the actual physical act of bread and wine or fasting or whatever that, that thing might be. And, you know, we all maybe have to ask ourselves the question a little bit here today. What bothers you when people don't do it? When they come into worship, they don't have shoes on? Will that bother you? My best friend used to lead worship barefooted. And I would get questioned about it all the time. Why doesn't he wear shoes? I'm like, I don't know. He's never told me. But what does it matter? Watch him lead worship. He sets himself on fire up there. Are you kidding me? He's passionate about it, like, but he doesn't have shoes on. Yeah, but, okay, well, let's get a guy that has shoes on that's terrible. And then we'll be okay, right? So you're punching the clock, right? You're checking your boxes about all this. So Jesus has an explanation for these guys. He says what? Now check it out. Hear, hear what he says. He doesn't say that his disciples will never fast. He doesn't say fasting is bad. He doesn't say we should quit fasting. He just simply says this is not the appropriate time. See, religious people are all about the, the, you know, the rhythm of all the rituals that are supposed to you know, be syncopated in our lives. But somebody that's given a relationship understands that there are times when the ritual takes a back seat to the relationship. And that's what Jesus is saying. While the groom is with them, of course they're not going to fast. After I'm gone, they're going to fast. But not now. They're not going to do it. He's trying to say to them what? There's a bigger picture of what's going on here other than just whether or not we are checking the box. And you're not seeing it. And then he kind of launches into this thing what? Where he starts talking about new wine and old wine skins and how to put a new piece of cloth on an old garment and and he, and he starts explaining all of these things that are sort of metaphors to get them to understand what, what is happening here. But can I tell you today that authentic faith is not best shown by robotically going through the motions of religious rituals. It's just not. It's about our heart, right? It's about our heart, about what we can seek and do. 
And so we always have to ask ourselves this question, am I in some way more dependent on ritual than I am on relationship? See? So notice the details, by the way. I think this is kind of interesting. You start reading the Gospels, you start really paying attention. You're like, okay, oh, oh they wrote that down. I mean, they could have said that a different way. Or they could have transitioned it a different way. They put that detail, up, that detail there for a reason. Listen to this one. It's, so he's talking to John's disciples, and what's he talking about? Old wine, new wine, right? Old wine, new wine, right? And here's, here's the phrase. And while he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter's died, but if you'll come and touch her, she'll live. Now, now get it, right? While he's talking about old wine and new wine, someone who represents the old wine, a synagogue leader, walks in. And did you notice this? He doesn't give a rip whether or not Jesus is fasting or not. It's not, he's not there to, to, to grade him on whether or not he's fulfilling all the requirements of the law. All he knows is this, is that his daughter is dead, and the one guy in Israel that can save his daughter is standing there, and he comes and he gets on his knees. John, the Baptist disciples are standing up arguing about theology. The guy who represents the old wine comes and says, I realize that the only thing that's going to save my daughter is the new wine. I don't care what package it comes in. Will you please come to my house and heal my daughter? He has no questions about religious ritual or what she's doing. And so he comes. And so point number two is this. The synagogue leader displays what I think we all have to have kind of consistently in our lives, and that's a desperate faith. I mean, this guy has more reason to follow the ritual of fasting than all of John's disciples added together because he's a leader in the synagogue, right? But his posture tells us that he doesn't care about that. He's on his knees before the Messiah saying, I know you can heal my daughter if you'll just come and touch her. He doesn't come to Jesus and, and say, you know, if you'll go back and, you know, review all the rules and follow them for another week, maybe next week you can heal my daughter. See, desperate faith is, er, it has a sense of urgency about it. And he has that. And so he comes and he asks that. And so, you know, it doesn't matter the protocol at that point. You ever been around somebody that was really desperate for help? I've seen it a few times in people's eyes when they go to hospitals and, you know, the doctor comes in and you're hoping, you're hoping that the doctor has some answer. You're hoping that something's different on the last test. I mean, people that are desperate, they're, they're not interested in the function of, of the package that it comes in. They just want the answer and the truth. And all of the superficial rules are at some level stripped away. And so I think, you know, this synagogue leader, the other gospels tell us his name. His name is Jairus. And his 12-year-old daughter is dead. And, he, you know, he says, forget all this. And I think here's the truth of it, that power doesn't come from being good at following rules. You know, I hate to tell you, I mean, just, you know, if you always pay your taxes on time and you always drive the speed limit and, you know, you follow all the other rules, besides being really boring, uh, you're just not going to get any extra power from that, right? So, it doesn't come from following the rules or being good at following rules. It comes from recognizing the Messiah and welcome him into your life. And so, you know, I don't know what we're hung up on. They were hung up on fasting and temple rituals. But even today, I think sometimes we can get hung up on certain things. Sometimes when people, uh, I bump into somebody I hadn't seen in a while, they're like, what are you doing? You still teach at the school? And I go, no, I don't teach at school. I, I preach at the Methodist church across the street from the school. You should come visit. You know, and I say this sometimes, right? And then people will say stuff like, I mean, if they're not a church person, they automatically, that's, that starts meaning something to them that doesn't mean to me, right? And they get uncomfortable, you know? It's like, well, if I came to church, the walls would fall down, and I, I'd have been in jail before, and, you know, I have all these habits, and I'm just like, it, it, you know what I do? I, I try to find a way to lower the threshold. I'm like, look, you can wear shorts. It's casual dress. We even drink coffee in our chairs, you know, back when we used to do that. That's coming again soon, by the way. And, and you just try to say, it's not about, all, I don't know what's in your head about what church is, but, but, you know, church is for us about relationship. So, 
What if the new wine that Jesus today, I mean, we can, we can point our finger at John the Baptist's disciples and kind of do that, but what about if the new wine that he wants to bring into our lives today doesn't fit into the framework of our past religious experiences? If it's new, it's new. And if your old wineskin is old, it's old. And new won't fit into old. And so he does something new and you kind of go, oh boy, that makes me uncomfortable. Or that kind of thing. And it can be that way. And then I want to say this about the woman. Uh, the woman's approach is simple and clear, right? By the way, he's going to hear, heal a 12-year-old daughter. And en route to do that, just then, this woman approaches him in the crowd. And he heals a woman who has what? 12-year history of bleeding. I don't know what all that means, but it's 12 and 12. Right? Desperate faith. Sometimes, by the way, when you're struggling, when you're ashamed, when you're hurting, whatever... Do you notice she comes in private? She didn't want to, she didn't come kneel like Jairus does. She tries to do it quietly and privately. Can I say to you today, some of you might be here today carrying some kind of hurt, some kind of something, and you need to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. You need him to put his hand on you, but you don't want to come down front. Can I tell you that that's okay? That he, he comes exactly the same way. Desperate faith can sometimes be private. And the more we're hurting sometimes and the more we need healing, the more we tend to not want to talk about it a whole lot with other people. And that's okay. And, and this woman came and did that. And I love this. You have to note this. That Jesus is en route to heal the synagogue leader's daughter. But he has compassion on someone. And there's a calm dignity that he displays to this woman in how he pauses in the midst of a mission to stop and heal her before he goes and heals the daughter. The Lord has time for us. And you've got to notice that for this woman, her desperate faith, there's no theological debate about fasting or anything else. It is simple and clear. He's the one that can heal me, and if I can get close enough to allow him to touch me, then I'll be able to do that. 